M2SYS Healthcare Solutions welcomes you to our latest podcast installment where we interview healthcare industry professionals for information, analysis, and opinions on the biggest issues that face the industry. Our latest podcast closely examines the topic of medical identity theft and how it affects patients, providers, and the healthcare industry. We are pleased at the opportunity to interview Jim Quiggle from the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud to discuss the causes and repercussions of medical identity theft, including what can be done to prevent it and what steps patients and doctors can immediately take after discovering they have been victims. Medical identity theft occurs when someone uses a person's name and sometimes other parts of their identity, such as insurance information, without the person's knowledge or consent to obtain medical services or goods, or uses the person's identity information to make false claims for medical services or goods. Medical identity theft frequently results in the creation of duplicate medical records and overlays, which include erroneous entries being put into existing medical records and can involve the creation of fictitious medical records in the victim's name. Medical identity theft is a crime that can cause great harm to its victims and directly jeopardizes patient safety. Yet despite the profound risk it carries, it is the least studied and most poorly documented of the cluster of identity theft crimes. It is also the most difficult to fix after the fact because victims have limited rights and recourses. Medical identity theft typically, typically leaves a trail of falsified information in medical records that can plague victims' medical and financial lives for years. The following podcast is a recording of our conversation with Jim Quiggle from the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud discussing medical identity theft. Welcome to the next installment in our series of podcasts examining some of the major issues that affect healthcare patients and providers. My name is John Trader and I am the public's public relations and marketing manager for M2SYS Technology, a biometrics research and development company based in Atlanta, Georgia. Today our guest is James Quiggle, Director of Communications with the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud, which is America's only anti-fraud alliance speaking for consumers, insurance companies, government agencies, and others. Through their unique work, the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud empowers customers to fight back, helps fraud fighters better detect this crime, and deters more people from committing fraud. The Coalition for Insurance Fraud supports this mission with a large and continually expanding armory of practical tools which include information, research and data, services and insight as a leading voice of the anti-fraud community. The Coalition has become one of America's most trusted and credible anti-fraud forces thanks to their remarkable diversity. Together, their members are working to control everyone's insurance costs, protecting the public's safety, and bringing this horrible crime to its knees. Since its founding in 1993, the Coalition has worked effectively to enact tough new anti-fraud laws and regulations, educate the public in how to fight back, and conduct objective and useful research on fraud, and bring together people and organizations in coalitions and alliances to work on specific areas of insurance fraud. The Coalition for Insurance Fraud's website is www.insurancefraud.org. James Quiggle is the Coalition's Director of Communications. A 20-year veteran of public relations and journalism, Jim joined the Coalition staff in March of 2000. He's busy stirring public outrage and stoking consumer report support with outreach campaigns that tell the tale of fraud, wag the tale of reform, and unite society to, to combat this crime. He oversees the coalition's outreach strategy, position, positioning the coalition as one of the most one of America's most trusted authorities on insurance fraud. He has headed public relations for two major national trade associations, the National Association of Professional Insurance Agents and the American Society of Civil Engineers. Most recently, he was a public relations consultant and business journalist specializing in high-tech, banking, trucking, youth services, and other industries. Jim also was an editor and reporter for a small-town daily newspaper, manager of communications for a Washington think tank covering the media's reporting of business, and lead writer for a public relations firm promoting prominent national sports events. He's been published in news outlets such as the Washington Post, Miami Herald, 
Chicago Sun-Times, Reno Gazette Journal, Virginia Business, and others. Jim also has won several public relations awards. He received a, a degree in psychology from Dickinson College. Jim, I want to welcome you to the podcast and thank you for lending us our time today. John, thanks very much. I'm very glad to be here. Great. Let's talk a little bit about U.S. health care. Uh, total health care spending in the U.S. is the highest of any other country in the world, and recent figures estimate that approximately 17.3% of GDP is spent on health care and medical costs are rising much faster than wages or inflation. The topic of medical identity theft in particular is becoming a concern of epidemic proportions for patients, health care providers, and health care plans. Not only is the federal government tra- cracking down on fraud, but health care providers are striving to implement policies, procedures, and technologies that will help them minimize the risk of data exposure. There are actually many different forms of identity theft. Med- medical identity theft in particular is one of the most damaging and potentially dangerous forms of identity theft and can be the most difficult to prevent or detect. Jim, can you please define define what medical identity theft is, how much it costs the country each year, and how many people are affected by it? John, absolutely. Medical identity theft is very simple. It's the theft of an individual's medical identifiers in order to obtain health coverage, medical care, medicines, hospital care, physical therapy, uh, psychotherapy, and other medical things that they want. In addition, medical identity theft is the mass theft of patient identification that's used and traded on the black market by uh, crooks who will use the, the lists stolen from providers to make huge numbers of damaging and fake medical claims against uh, health insurances, insurance companies, as well as uh, federal programs such as Medicare and Medicaid. Thanks for that information, Jim. Our our research also has shown that the average cost to restore a patient's identity after being victimized by identity theft is over $20,000, which I I don't think most people understand. And, and, I mean, that's a number that's higher than the average cost to feed a family of four for one year or the cost uh, of of one year of in-state public university tuition. Does that number sound about right in terms of your experience and what you've seen people having to pay out of their own pockets to restore their identity after being victimized by medical identity theft? John, that does sound about right in, in terms of the hours you, you expended, which is time equals money. In terms of the cost, you may have to incur in terms of uh, you know hiring legal care, uh, search firms, and other uh, tools that you need to uh, make your, your name good name whole again. I mean, the fact is, I'm going to back up here for a second. This crime is uh, huge, and it's the fastest growing form of identity theft. Um, 1.4 million Americans have been victimized uh, by medical identity theft in just 2010 alone. Wow. And that that amounted to uh, a cost of of $30.9 billion. So we're we're dealing with a big-time crime here uh, that affects a lot of Americans. So you start uh, multiplying the number of Americans who by 20,000, and you have a huge, huge uh, cost. Um, The other thing to remember, too, is uh, it takes about two years for uh, a consumer to resolve her or her identity theft and and make their good name whole. That's an awful lot of time. Why such a long time, Jim? Why why does it take what would seem like an inordinate amount of time to clear your name? Well, you, you have to go through a lot of steps. First of all, you have to you have to search your your credit record and find out uh, what's wrong with it and why. Uh, what are the things that have been done to to blow your credit record? Then you have to go through a long process of assembling the evidence that you need to convince the uh, credit services that your your identity has in fact been stolen. And in addition, then you have to go back into your medical files and start making sure that medicine that uh, that's incompatible with you or uh, blood types and other things have uh, are, are not stuck in your files. 
Plus, you have to find, identify all the medical establishments that you may have been defrauded by and contact them and, and see if you can convince them to change uh, the records. Interesting. And, and that's actually a great segue into the second question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, and, and that is, uh, Jim, what, what are the most serious consequences of, of, of for a patient that's victimized by medical identity theft? What are some things that, that, that can happen? Well, you, you you can be hit hard in a number of ways as as a consumer. Uh, first of all, you, your credit record can get shot to all pieces because the, the hospital bills that a crook is building up in your good name are not getting paid. So the, the bills are are sent over to the credit uh, reporting agencies, and guess what? Um, you've got some bad uh, bills on on your record, which is going to shoot your credit record straight down. And guess what happens then? Maybe you can't get a mortgage, or you have to sell for a higher rate. Maybe you can't get a personal loan. Uh, maybe you can't get a, a loan for, for, for your, your kid's education. A lot of things can happen if your credit record is, is shot down. Uh, you have to worry about your personal health also. Uh, if you're, if a met, if the crook's medicine hap- that you may be allergic to is lodged in your records, and then let's say you get hauled into an emergency room, semi-conscious, and the medicine on your records <laughs> happens to be something they need to to uh, do, to work uh, to, to give to you, um, you, you're not there to say no. This is something I'm allergic to. Uh, same thing with a blood type. If it's an allergic blood type and you're bleeding blood badly after a car crash, well, you've, you've got a problem because bad blood is in your records and you're going to be given it and you may not be able to say no. Um, consider also, you have claims against your health policy. The chances, there's a good chance that the claims might be large enough to max out your policy limits. And where does that leave you uh, without health coverage? Thank you for that information, Jim. I, I, I feel that sometimes people don't understand what the consequences of being a victim of medical identity theft are, and those were some very good points. Thank you. Um, let's change gears for a moment and discuss uh, who is actually affected by medical identity theft. I, when we think about medical identity theft, I think most often we think, about the consequences for the patient first. But I think what most people don't realize is that patients aren't the only demographic that can be victimized by medical identity theft. In reality, there are actually two forms of medical identity theft, the kind that involves a patient's data being stolen and the kind that involves the physician's professional identifiers or credentials being stolen. Jim, can you talk to us for a few minutes about what are the effects of medical identity theft on physicians? Well, it, there's different consequences depending on the kind of theft. If a physician's own medical identity uh, is stolen and used to make claims, such as uh, against Medicare, which which does happen often, then um, you've got a significant problem because your good name is being used uh, to steal, and word gets out. Uh, that uh, you're involved with uh, theft, uh, you, you've got to worry about uh, your reputation being compromised. You have to worry about potentially uh, your, your clients uh, leaving if, if you're involved in even, even though inaccurately in, in a health scam. Um, you're going to find that you're going to have to spend a lot of time justifying that you're not, uh, that your name was you misused by a crook, and just like a consumer has to spend a lot of time uh, clearing up their name, the physician has to spend a lot of time out of their practice, um, making sure that their record does not show that they have been involved in a fraudulent claim. The other part um, of medical identity theft is a data breach against your patient's data, your files. It's possible that a a database technician uh, could be bribed to go into your records and and steal all your patient's information, sell it on the black market. Well, a a lot of things kick in. You've got to 
spend a tremendous amount of time identity, you know, telling your patients and notifying them that there has been a data breach and their names may be compromised. You may have to deal with, you know, investigations as to whether you're in co uh, compliance with, with the HIPAA regulations and, and other federal regulations. Patients themselves, it, they, they might decide to sue you if they were seriously damaged and, and their still identity was stolen on your watch. As, as a physician. A lot of bad things can happen, and none of them are good. Very interesting. We actually read recently in an article that more than 5,300 physicians have listed themselves in a federal database that tracks medical identity theft, so the problem is obviously severe and, and growing. Uh, one other thing that uh, I, at least our research has shown and, and that we've uncovered in terms of the effect of medical identity theft on patients, or excuse me, on physicians to their patients, is that patients have been reporting losing trust in their physicians after a medical identity theft has occurred. Uh, so, in other words, if a patient finds out that their physician somehow subjected their medical record to a criminal, they may not be as willing to go back to that physician for either follow-up care or care for the rest of their family. And you and I both know that the healthcare industry is a very cutthroat industry in terms of competition to get patients but also keep the patients for life. So I would think that patients reporting losing trust should be a serious uh, concern for, for physicians that are, that are victims of medical identity theft as well. Well, well, John, I think you're right on target there. Reputational damage is, is one of exactly. the largest uh, impacts on, on physicians of a data breach. Um, you've got to go out there and, and tell all your patients that uh, you didn't have enough security in place to protect uh, their most sensitive uh, personal medical information. And now it's, their medical information is out there, possibly in the hands of a crook, and you've got to tell your patients that. Gee, that, that's not going to make you look very good, and it it may not it may be a shame. You may have done your very best, but our patients going to listen to that. All they know is bottom line, zero sum game. Your you your their your information was stolen on their information was stolen on your watch, mm -hmm. and that just doesn't look good. The potential to lose clients and and possible possibly face lawsuits if in fact damage occurs to that client is, is not insignificant. That's great information. Thank you, Jim. You, you actually alluded to medical uh, data breaches a few minutes ago. Let's talk about them just for a minute. Uh, they're actually a growing phenomenon and, and becoming more widespread throughout the industry. In fact, in 2012 alone, just the top 10 healthcare data breaches uh, exposed over 1.8 million health records. And the Utah, the Utah Department of Health breach in March of last year led the list with over 780,000 health records stolen. It, it seems like health care facilities have a responsibility to protect patient data and data breaches that lead to cases of medical identity theft, and, and which continues to be a problem for healthcare facilities. Uh, Jim, can you tell us if a healthcare facility is subjected to a data breach, what responsibilities do they have to their patients w when victimized? Well, John, let me back up one sec just to amplify the issue that you've raised because it's a very, uh, I think, a critical one. The, the research now does show that only about 40% of medical providers have confidence that they can prevent or quickly detect patient data loss or patient theft. And the second thing to be aware of is the average cost for an organization uh, is about $2.4 million over two years to uh, clean up a data breach. So we're, we're talking significant time, uh, reputational damage, money, and, and other costs. In terms of, uh, in terms of getting yourself whole if you've been breached. Mm -hmm. Now, back to your next question, your question, John. Um, would you repeat the question? Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just looking for some. Yeah, feedback. I thought it was important to get that. I thought it was important to get that data in the play. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just looking for some feedback. Uh, if, if a healthcare facility is subjected to a, to a data breach, what, what responsibilities do they have to their patients uh, when when they're victimized? The first thing you need to do, John, is you need to notify your patients. You need to do it very quickly. Um, there's no choice in the matter there. 
The second thing you need to do is uh, review your all of your procedures and make sure and find out what went wrong, uh, how it went wrong, uh, what you need to do to correct it, and that could be a very substantial issue because you, you don't know whether you uh, was an insider job or whether you were you were hacked, and that uh, potentially could make a lot of time. You also have to do a HIPAA re review and make sure that you're in compliance with all HIPAA uh, rules and, and other federal rules. Um, that uh, could uh, cost you quite a bit of time and, and, and money, but you, you have to do it. And another prop, another uh, challenge is uh, you may have to uh, correct uh, a lot of patient records farther down the line if claims are made against uh, their, their records uh, that were on your files. Now, Jim, I would venture to say that it's also critically important for a healthcare organization to be completely transparent in the wake of a data breach and be as upfront and honest to their patients about the consequences of, of that breach, what types of proactive steps are being taken to prevent future breaches and how patients can act to, on their own to protect their own medical uh, data. Uh, just kind of a summary of, of what, you, what you pointed out there. I think with the advent of social media, a lot of healthcare consumers or, or patients have new forms of communication that they can get the message out about their uh, unhappiness with either a healthcare facility or, or a particular physician's office. So I think that healthcare organizations have to be very careful uh, about reporting these these data breaches, and as you pointed out, immediately report them and be as upfront as possible because of what we talked about earlier, the possibility of losing trust in the patient. So the social media really has, I think, projected or amplified the need for healthcare organizations to be as transparent as possible. Well, that, that's a, a very excellent point, John. The, the fact is that everyone suddenly becomes a journalist mm -hmm. yeah, uh, when it exactly. comes to social media, and, and everyone has an opinion. And so they're they're going to be out there, and uh, your name could be uh, put into the ether and spread very quickly, very virally, uh, if if an, enough people start, uh, uh, you know, discovering that their their uh, identities have been breached, which they will uh, when they're notified. So. All the more important to make sure that, as a physician, you're taking proactive uh, for, you're taking proactive steps. What training are you giving to your employees under HIPAA compliance rules to make sure that they're aware of the, the warning signs of a data breach and that they're what which you're going to protect? What, what are your uh, systems in place? Your IT systems uh, doing to uh, how how are you safeguarding your systems against it? Um, how are you making sure that your employees have only the, the data that they the information that they need to uh, do their jobs? What we're finding is that uh, often in smaller medical facilities, it's it's the insider jobs, the, the employees with vast access to patient data more than they need to do their jobs correctly. Um, often are the ones that are stealing uh, your records. So that's very, very important to uh, make sure that uh, employees have only the data they, they need to do the job ex well. And the other thing is you have a lot of people who come into your office and they're going to be try to look over people's shoulders or, or look onto the screens um, of, of, of and, and see if they can steal patients' information just visually. I mean, I, I've gone into my own doctor's offices and, and, and found that the screens have been practically turned over right in front of anybody who wants to look. And I'm saying, wait a minute here. <laughs> that, that's my identity there. Right. Is, is, a, a, could, could be looking over my shoulder and taking this down. That's a great point. Uh, I, I think protection of, of data in a physician's office is certainly something that uh, the healthcare industry is looking a little more closely into, especially in the wake of a lot of these uh, these recent breaches uh, affecting really every type of healthcare organization that there is. Well, if you don't, then uh, you're, you're looking at uh, potential violations of HIPAA privacy rules. Um, you, you, you simply have to take proactive steps to try to uh, head these things off because you, you know there's a, a possibility that it could happen. Absolutely. Hackers are getting good, and insider jobs are, are, are also a, a constant uh, concern. 
It would seem that in cases of medical identity theft, that insurance companies will be well served with access to a concrete audit trail in place to help refute any false patient claims, trace a health care visit, and basically get a clear picture of medical history. Along these lines, Jim, do insurance companies see value in having some sort of an audit trail with a unique patient identifier, like a biometric? And would insurance companies be willing to share in the cost of something like that with the hospital? Um, I'll I'll give you a partial answer, John. Okay. Um, No, insurance companies definitely see a a value to an audit trail because this... Um, helps them create a, a much clearer record of what happened and and how to trace back all the uh, elements and steps of a crime. Um, th- this also uh, has a, a lot of legal uh, implications, too, that can help uh, protect an insurance company and show that it has taken all the legal steps uh, required under uh, federal rules to uh, uh, comply with, with privacy and, and protection. Um, now, biometrics are, are a growing field. It's not just something that insurers are involved with. Um, uh, hospitals and other medical providers are, are beginning to experiment uh, increasingly with biometrics. I think this is one of the, uh, the uh, really interesting issues of patient protection coming down the road. There's a lot of new technology. Iris scanning you know, is is being experimented with, for example. And so you can create a, a what amounts to a visual fingerprint. Palm scanning, because the, the, the veins of your palm and the, the lines in your palm uh, create a v- very unique record. And of course, there's good old-fashioned fingerprinting. And uh, down the road, I, I can see a, 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 farther, a much wider use of, of smart cards that contain a load of patient identification that would make it very hard for a stranger to walk in with that card and, and uh, be able to use it effectively. Okay, great. Thank you for the feedback on that question. Let's, uh, let's talk for a minute about the Affordable Care Act, mm-hmm. which was signed into law in March of 2010, but I, I don't feel that until recently we've, we've kind of understood the full impact that this legislation could potentially have on the healthcare industry. Within the provisions of that act, there's a section that mandates all uninsured in the U.S. purchase some, some form of medical insurance through what are called health insurance exchanges, which are basically a set of government regulated and standardized healthcare plans in the U.S. from which individuals uh, may purchase health insurance eligible for federal subsidies. Jim, with the influx of new health care patients due to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, wh- what impact do you expect this may have on medical identity theft and insurance fraud? Well, it, it, there's a, pot- a lot of potential uh, ramifications. Uh, peop- the hackers are going to go after that data. There's going to be a tremendous influx of data into the uh, medical providers that are involved uh, with the exchanges. And that data is going to be very valuable. If you get a name that's worth $50 or more on the market compared to about a dollar or so for a social security number. So th- this is gold, and the crooks are going to be going after the gold. The, the pressure is going to be on providers to make sure that their systems are uh, armor-plated uh, with titanium against uh, fraud, um, especially insurance companies. Um, they're going to be uh, challenged to create robust systems that are flexible, that can identify cons as they're foisted, uh, rather than looking in the rearview mirror afterwards. This is going to be the job of, of predictive analysis and, and other forms of, of far advanced technology. So the, 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 the danger is going to be there. The other problem, too, is that not all organizations are going to be fully, uh, you know, solely operating in exchanges. You, you can also operate outside of an exchange. And, uh, you know, people can buy insurance outside of an exchange. Uh, there's a price to be paid, but you can do it. So what does that mean? Well, um, you, you have freestanding insurers just like we do now uh, that's, who still might be susceptible to uh, fraud. And you have consumers who might be susceptible to fraud, whether inside or outside of an exchange. 
So the, the it's still going to be a, a wild west to some degree, especially when it comes to uh, cyber attacks aimed at uh, extracting data uh, in high volume from uh, exchange members. Okay, that's great information. Thank you for the feedback on that. Let's talk for a second about victims of medical identity theft and what some uh, some telltale signs are that a person might be a victim. Uh, because I think patients may be for an extended period of time not even aware that they're victims of medical identity theft. Can you share with us some of what those telltale signs are that you have been a victim of medical identity theft and what steps patient can, patients can actually take to prevent to excuse me, prevent medical identity theft in the future? Yes, John, uh, excellent question. John, there are many telltale signs that your identity may have been stolen. One of the first and most obvious is when you get your statements from your insurance company and you start seeing uh, bills for procedures uh, on days that you you were vacationing in Hawaii and these are for, for operations, you could be, uh, that's a huge sign. I mean, I, I've seen a case, one case where an individual received a bill for a leg amputation uh, for another person. And the person took that bill into the medical facility and showed it in front of them on two good legs and said, hey, I, I can assure you this was not my leg operation. So you need to watch your, your bills. You need to look out for your medical statements closely. The second thing you need to be aware of and wor- worry about is you if you start finding that uh, your um, insurance bills are going up, like your auto insurance, or that you're not getting loans, uh, mortgages, personal loans, educational loans, or that your rates are getting high, um, you're, you're going to find this out during the loan process because your your credit history is going to come up. And you're, you're going to find that you've, you've been dinged pretty significantly. And you're going to wonder why that happened because you've been paying all your bills regularly. Then you have to go back to your health, your, your credit uh, provider, and you're going to find to your horror that um, there's a load of unpaid hospital bills in your name that are being used to lower your credit rating. Not a good thing. You mentioned earlier medical statements, Jim. Are you referring to things like explanation of benefits and how important it is for patients to read thoroughly uh, each of those documents uh, after they've gone for either a hospital visit or a visit to a physician's office? Is that what you're referring to, the explanation of benefits? Yes, I am, John. Um, the, these bills come out monthly, and they're often very hard to read, and they're not graphically easy to read, uh, and so it's easy to kind of dismiss them or toss them aside because you, know, you say, oh, well, I haven't been to, to uh, had any treatment lately, so I don't have to worry about it. You toss it into the trash can, and you don't, want, you don't, you don't even like reading it to begin with. Mm-hmm. You should check very closely every month to make sure that, uh, your hospital bills reflect all the treatment that you have incurred during the last month. Failure to do, failure to do so uh, could uh, just reduce, could take result in your credit taking a big whack. You know that's that's a great point, and I I, I really feel sometimes that. A lot of the problems that stem from medical identity theft, uh, how to prevent it, steps to take if you're a victim of it, have to do with education. And I, I, just from my own reading on the topic, I've seen that there are a lot of healthcare providers that do a great job in educating patients about how to protect themselves again, how to look for telltale signs that you discussed. For example, um, I, I saw a recent uh, report that was done by the Ponemon Institute, uh, and some of these numbers that they that they published about medical ID uh, theft are, are alarming. Only 15% of the 800 or so people they surveyed were familiar with the term medical identity theft. 15% are actually able to define what it is of those that were familiar with the term. 19% of the people that were surveyed think it would take less than two weeks to correct their medical ID if stolen. And you mentioned two years is usually the average, so there's obviously a huge disconnect there. 
Uh, 22% believe that the most likely consequence of medical ID theft is their insurance will be canceled. As we know from our discussion with you, that's just the tip of the iceberg. 24% uh, of the people surveyed have checked their medical records for fraud, which I think is a, a really low number. 32% think it's likely that their medical identification will be stolen, and 56% think it's likely their credit card or their credit number, uh, credit card number will be stolen. So just from reading off those numbers and briefly discussing about education, it seems like the industry has, has quite a ways to go in terms of making this a top-of-the-mind thing and, and educating people on how to, how to prevent it and detect it. John, you're 100% on target. Um, people tend to be very passive about this crime because it, it's abstract. They, they don't quite get it. They don't understand what it is fully. And so they, they tend to, people tend to dismiss what they don't really understand. This is why the uh, healthcare industry at all levels, insurance companies, uh, individual uh, providers such as physicians and others, really need to take the lead in educating consumers to play how to play their role in heading off medical scams, what to do if medical if a ID theft has been discovered, and to help them understand their stake in this crime if it's uh, made against them. Providers, uh, physicians especially, uh, because they have good relationships, uh, in, in very many cases close relationships with their with their clients, their patients, um, I think they, they, they're in a perfect position to uh, provide material to their patients on medical identity theft, actually to be the, the, the tip of the spear Sure. in terms of letting people know that this is a crime that they need to uh, play a, a role in, in, in taking care of. Absolutely. And just kind of recapping a little bit of what you talked about earlier, um, we, we discussed the fact that hypothetically if you are a victim of medical identity theft, it's very critical that you act swiftly and deliberately to fix the issue. Let me let me throw this question at you, Jim. If, if you do find out that you are a victim of medical identity theft, and I know you've covered a little bit of, of this in our prior conversation, but maybe you can just kind of reiterate what steps you can take to immediately ad address the problem if you somehow discover that you've been a victim. This is as a consumer. Yes. As a consumer. Um, yeah. um, if you discovered you've been a victim, the, you have to move fast, you have to move quickly, because the damage to your uh, credit, uh, the damage to you financially is, is going to continue, because uh, crooks are going to continue to mine your identity for uh, more and more claims, unless you put a stop to it immediately. If you've been a victim, go to the police, let them know, so there's a, a, a record on, on that uh, this crime has happened that can start an investigation. Uh, second, check the credit rating services and find out if your record has, if your credit has been compromised. Then work with them to provide the evidence that they need to uh, help clear your record. Um, you also need to go to your medical providers, especially your primary, who will be the first person who, to correct your identity. But then you have to identify all the others and find, make sure that your medical records are cleared, that there's no uh, funny business, no false claims, no medicine, no uh, uh, blood types, and, and, and other uh, disruptive information that could uh, soil your record and, and possibly expose you to your to uh, physical and medical harm. Yeah, absolutely. Those are those, those are great uh, steps. I di I didn't even think about alerting the police. That's so key because they really need to develop some sort of a record of you being victimized, but also look for patterns. I, I think that's kind of what they what they look at because.